Welcome back to my series of presentations on mortgage-backed securities. So let's let's review what we've already uh, gone over. So I've already drawn here. I actually prepared ahead of time. So I've already drawn here uh, kind of what we've already talked about. So we started with borrowers who need to buy houses. Uh, each of them borrowed a million dollars. So actually, let me write that down. Let me change the color of my pen. Where'd my pen go? There it goes. Okay. So each of these people borrowed one million dollars. One million. Oh, that's too fat. I don't. Pen. Where is a thinner pen? Okay. Each of them borrowed a, a million dollars, and there were a thousand of them, right? So a million dollars times a thousand—that's a billion dollars that they needed. And then they said that they would pay 10% a year on that money that they borrowed. So that's 10% uh, for each of them is a hundred thousand dollars. And then, as we said, there's a thousand borrowers, so they're going to put in a hundred million dollars, right? A hundred thousand times a thousand is a hundred million. So just to simplify, keep it in your mind: one billion dollars goes to a bunch of borrowers, goes to a thousand borrowers to be specific. And then each year, those borrowers are going to give. The, spe the special purpose entity. This is just a corporation designed to to kind of structure these mortgage ba these mortgage backed securities. They're going to give 10% of the billion or 100 million dollars back into this. And then we said, okay, well, where does that money for this special purpose entity or for this corporation comes from? Well, it comes from the investors in the actual mortgage backed securities. So let's say that there's a um, and and just to be clear, so the asset within within this um, entity. Is the loans, or are the loans? Let me see. Let me where did my pen go? So loans, the loans are the main asset that's inside of the special purpose entity, and the loans are just the right on these 10% payments. And so the money came from when the owners of each of these mortgage-backed securities, each let's say paid a thousand dollars for the mortgage-backed securities, and in return they're going to get 10% on their money. So each security costs a thousand dollars, and then they're going to get a hundred dollars back per month. And we said there are a million of these securities, so thousand dollars times a million—that's where the billion dollars comes from. Me, my thing's been acting up. That's where the billion dollars comes from. That essentially is lent to the borrowers, and these guys will get ten percent. Now, one thing I, I want you to keep in mind is they get ten percent only if. Every one of these borrowers pays their loans, never defaults, uh, never prepays. Prepaying a mortgage is just you know saying I sold a house, so I don't need the mortgage anymore, so I just pay it off. So it's only 10% indefinitely if if all of the borrowers pay all the money and um, um, never default or, or anything like that. So this 10% is kind of in an ideal world. Well, everyone knows that it, it's not going to be exactly 10%. Some percentage of these borrowers are going to default on their mortgage. Some of them are going to pay ahead of time. And actually, that's what the buyer of the mortgage-backed security should, should uh, try to figure out. And all sorts of buyers are going to have all sorts of different assumptions. And this is what you've probably read some articles about. Um, about these hedge funds with these computer models to to value their their mortgage backed securities and that's what those computer models do they try to look at historical data and figure out okay for a given uh, population pool in a given part of the country what percentages of them uh, are able to pay off their mortgage what percentage of them default on their mortgage and when they default uh, what is kind of the recovery you know if they say they default on a million dollar mortgage and then um, the special purpose entity would get control of that house and then if that house is sold for i don't know five hundred thousand dollars because the, the property value went down then the recovery would be fifty percent so that's all of, all of the things that uh, someone needs to factor in when they figure out what will be the real return ten percent is if everyone pays so let's let's make some very simple assumptions um, for ourselves to kind of let's say we are thinking about investing in a mortgage backed security and we want to gauge for ourselves what we think the return is going to be well let's say we know that this pool of borrowers that let me see that my pen keeps stop work working. That 20% will default. 20% will default. We're not going to worry about prepayment rates and all things like that. Let's say 20% are going to default, and then on those 20% that default, so these are you know of these thousand borrowers, 200 of them are just going to lose their job or whatever. They can't afford a mortgage anymore. And of those 20% that default, we have a 50% recovery. 50% recovery. So that means. You know, borrower X uh, defaulted on his loan, and then when we we go and get the property because that the loan was secured by the property, and when we auction off the property, we only get five hundred thousand dollars for it. So we get a fifty percent recovery, fifty percent of the original value of the loan. So if twenty percent uh, default, and then there's a fifty percent recovery, 
then on average, you're going to get 10%, 10% of the loan is worthless. And I'm going to make some kind of hand-waving assumptions here or there. But you can, you can assume statistically, and since this is a large number of bars, it's 1,000, right? If there's only one borrower, it would be hard to kind of gauge when he defaults, if he defaults at all. We would just know that there's a 20% chance. But when there's a large number of borrowers, you can kind of do the math and say, OK, on average, 200 of these guys are going to default. And in, instead of actually getting a 10%, um, since 20, since 10% of the loans are going to be worthless, I'm going to get 10% less than this 10%. So I'm going to get 9%. So this is based on the model that we just constructed. right? The model is, this is the model that we constructed. This is a much simpler model than what most people use. But based on the model that we just constructed, I think the real return we're going to get on this mortgage-backed security is 9%. If there was another uh, uh, investor who assumed a 50% default rate, but with a higher recovery, he or she would uh, have a different kind of uh, expected return from this security. So why is this even uh, useful? Well, think about it. Before, in, in the case we did in the first video, when someone just borrows from the bank, uh, the bank has, has very specific uh, lending requirements. They have their own model. They have, so th there's a, a whole class of, an, of, of borrowers that they might have not been able to service. Right? There might be people with really good credit scores, really good incomes, who don't have a down payment. And if they don't meet the, what the bank's requirements are, they'd never get a loan. But there are probably some investors out there that would say, you know what, for the right interest rate and for the right you know, assumptions in my model, I'm willing to give anybody a loan as long as I'm compensated for it enough. And this is what this mortgage-backed security uh, market allows. It allows, let's say this group of borrowers, let's say this pool of borrowers right here actually um, didn't, this, this pool of borrowers right here, let me see something about my. This pool of borrowers actually aren't the the traditional, you know, they don't have 25% down, and they don't, uh, and and they don't have the, um, and, and they don't have kind of the traditional requirements to get a normal mor mortgage. But if if I pool a bunch of people who don't have those traditional requirements, but they're good in other ways, maybe they have a high income or high credit score, I can go through this alternate mechanism to find investors that are willing to loan them money. So essentially, from the borrower's point of view, it allows more access to loan funding um, that, that, and they would have otherwise not been able to. And from an investor point of view, it allows another place for me to invest in. Maybe my specialty is, maybe I feel that the computer models that I have are really good at predicting things like default rates and recovery rates and um, you know, what a loan is, is worth. And I feel that I can, in some, in, in some ways, be a better loan officer than the banks. And this would be an attractive uh, place for me to invest in. Um, it's also, it, it just might just have a risk reward characteristic that isn't that doesn't exist in the market already, and it allows you to, to kind of diversify into one other asset class. So that's the value that it has across uh, the entire spectrum. Now in the next presentation, I'm going to show how you can, I guess, further complicate this even more uh, so that so that you can open up the investment to even a larger group of investors. Because you can think about it right now, there's probably some people who say, okay, you know, I already said, some people will do these models and try to make their own assumptions and say, OK, this is going to give me 9% a year. But then there's a whole bunch of people who are going to say, boy, this is too complicated for me. This seems risky. I don't have any fancy models. Um, I only like to invest in things where I know I get my money. You know, this very highly rated uh, debt is where I'm going to invest my money. And then there's another group of people who say, OK, 9%, that's nice and everything, but I'm a hot shot. I'm a gambler. 9% isn't the type of returns I want. I want to take more risk and more return. And, and so there should be something, maybe, for those people as well. So that's what we're going to show you in the presentation on collateralized debt obligations.